Welcome to Bloomer Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. The first black and Asian American woman has been chosen as a vice presidential candidate. Former Vice President Joe Biden has chosen California Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate. The former vice president tweeting just in the last hour. I have the great honor to announce that I've picked Kamala Harris, a fearless fighter for the little guy and one of the country's finest public servants as my running mate. Back when Kamala was attorney general, she worked closely with Bo, Joe Biden's son. I watched as they took on the big banks, lifted up working people, and protected women and kids from abuse. I was proud then, and I'm proud now to have her as my partner in this campaign. I want to take a look now first at how this is impacting the markets. Bring in our Abigail Doolittle, who's been following all the back and forth. Abigail, markets turned slightly lower, sharply lower at the close today. How are they looking now after hours? Well, you know, it is interesting, Emily, because we have seen a little bit of a risk on reaction to the announcement of Kamala Harris as uh, Joe Biden's VP pick. And specifically, the S&P 500 E-mini futures now down about half a percent relative to the close of down about nine tenths of one percent. Bonds also a little bit lower than they were at the close. So again, a little bit of a, a risk on mood on that announcement, but on the day, not so much. That S&P 500 falling down about eight tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ 100 down even more, down 1.9% down uh, for a third day in a row. This really as investors have been going into some of the cyclical sectors, such as the financials and out of big tech. And one of those big tech names, Emily, take a look at Apple there, down about 3%, really a brutal day. Now, a piece of this is Evercore ISI flagging the fact that uh, China's smart phone that there could be a slump. But another piece of it, I would say, in silver right there, the futures have reopened for silver on the day. So right now up one tenth of one percent. But for the day that just was, Emily, down 15 percent for spot silver, the worst day since 2008. The connection to technology too far too fast. In fact, if we go into the Bloomberg terminal, I can show you what I'm talking about, because, of course, these are uh, you wouldn't think that they're risk assets. What I would say gold, silver and Apple all have in common. They are Fed liquidity assets. So out of the March low, uh, Apple up uh, more than 100 percent, silver up 150 percent. They chart in a very similar manner. The fact that silver has now given up so much of that rally suggests something similar could be ahead for Apple, even though the fundamentals are great there, perhaps a little bit ahead of itself, especially relative to valuation. I know you're going to be watching closely how the markets are digesting this news. Tomorrow, there was some pessimism towards the end of the day. Uh, Senator Mitch McConnell saying that talks on a new relief bill at a stalemate. What do you imagine this news about Kamala Harris being picked as uh, the VP, uh, Joe Biden's running mate? How do you imagine that investors will digest that news uh, and make some decisions tomorrow? So many of the strategists, or at least a couple of the strategists that I have heard speak about this, think that whoever Joe Biden picked, it wouldn't be that big of a market-moving event. Now, again, after hours, we did see a little bit of relief for the future, suggesting that there was just a little bit of a risk on mood there. Uh, but frankly, I think people are probably going to be investor traders happy, you know, that that ticket is uh, closed up to some degree, some certainty. Markets always like certainty. But in terms of whether or not the pick of Kamala Harris, Harris will affect the corporate profit outlook is unlikely. It's more just, again, the certainty in terms of a pick being made into the DNC uh, convention, virtual convention, I should say. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what does happen if there is something separate. But again, most of the strategists that I have been listening to on this, not expecting too much reaction, no matter who it was. Uh, and again, today we have had a slight risk on move, but, you know, really pretty small. Well, and Abigail, you could look at Senator Harris as perhaps the least risky pick he could have made. Obviously, she's already run for president. She's already, in a way, been, been, been vetted by the American public. How does that then impact the decisions that are made, you know, not just into tomorrow, but over the next several weeks? Obviously, Biden has revealed his, his economic plan. Now we can assume that Senator Harris will have some influence on that, you know, given her, her policies, the issues that she has taken on, how do you expect that to play out? 
You know, Emily, I think that what I would expect to play out perhaps around Kamala Harris is that she, Harris, is that she really makes a formidable uh, opponent, I believe, for President Trump because she is very fiery on the debate stage. Uh, she does not hold back. So putting aside policy decisions, uh, she seems like it would, she would be uh, a relatively uh, I hate to use this word, but like a risk on, a bullish pick for Joe Biden from the standpoint of really being able to take out President Trump potentially just because of um, that, you know, that oomph that she has in her. Very articulate, uh, not afraid, fearless in some ways. So when, you know, President Trump goes on stage against people, a lot of times he um, is very argumentative against them uh, and has quick phrases to, you know, potentially uh, damage them. That might not be true with her. She's pretty tough. So if she could be a real really uh, strong running mate from that that standpoint plus she's obviously much younger than Joe Biden so who knows as time goes on again the certainty of the fact that the ticket is wrapped up but some of those factors that she is such a formidable uh, candidate and opponent for President Trump in some ways especially around talking and debate um, that might make a risk on script right. going forward. Absolutely, and she certainly made her name as a prosecutor and has been known for her tough questioning in Senate hearings. Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. Um, joining us now, we've got Rick Davis, our Bloomberg contributing editor, and former uh, McCain, Senator John McCain, presidential advisor. Obviously, uh, Rick, you have some experience in these parts. Curious, first of all, for your reaction to Senator, Senator Kamala Harris being the pick here. I think uh, Abigail put it in a very nice business context, but she was the safe pick, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, Joe Biden was uh, looking for someone who wouldn't upset the apple cart. He's leading in almost every uh, battleground state. He's uh, got a good national polling uh, comfort margin. And so he wanted someone who could appeal to the base of the party, uh, ensure a good turnout, and, uh, and not make any mistakes. And so... Uh, Kamala Harris distinguished herself uh, both in her Senate runs and uh, in her sort of abbreviated presidential campaign as someone who could stick to the script. In, in fact, it may actually be one of her shortcomings as a candidate is that she's a little bit script driven. She certainly is the safer bet. She's won three elections in my state, the state of California. She's an Oakland native. Um, my neighborhood, so, so a lot of excitement in these parts. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, going with the safe bet here. Obviously, um, you have some experience with, uh, you know, Senator McCain picking Sarah Palin as, as his running mate, perhaps probably the most memorable and, and later controversial pick uh, for a vice presidential candidate. Um, do you think uh, Vice President Biden um, learned from that, essentially, and, and didn't want to make any rash decisions or have any surprises, given how critical this election is? Yeah, I think it just depends upon where you are in your campaign. You know, when John McCain made his selection of Sarah Palin, he was 15 points back, no real good options to win the election. Uh, on the horizon, <clears throat> back up against the wall with the convention the next week, much like the timing of this pick. And uh, and so he had to shake it up, right? It was a big risk-reward kind of option for him. Uh, Joe Biden's in a completely different place. In fact, Joe Biden exemplifies the pick of a candidate who's 15 points up. That's a Barack Obama when he's picked Joe Biden. He was the safe pick, steady Eddie. You know, he knew a lot about foreign policy, national security, added that to the Obama ticket. And that's what he's done with, with Kamala Harris. Now, I would say one core element of this is that um, the Democratic Party need a big black turnout for Election Day. Um, it's what escaped uh, from their quotient in 2016 when Trump won. Uh, they need a Barack Obama-style 2008-2012 turnout in a minority community uh, to ensure a victory. And and they're banking on Kamala Harris to, to drive some of that, and, and she should. She's well-known in the community, and she can excite people. So I, I don't think it was a risky bet. 
So let's talk about the environment that this is now happening in. Of course, Kamala Harris, the first uh, black woman on the ticket, the first Asian American woman on the ticket in the middle of the Black Lives Matter movement as it's crescendoing. You know, some of the biggest, biggest criticisms of her have been that she was too tough as a prosecutor on, on black Americans. Though she does have a long history in law enforcement, there's great potential for her to help Joe Biden reform the criminal justice system. Do you expect that, that uh, she's going to have a target on? Uh, on her back, though, because of, of these issues, despite the fact uh, that she is a minority running mate here. Yeah, look, the greatest advantage that Republicans have is the Democratic Party. Uh, they do have a tendency to turn on themselves. Uh, in this case, though, I would say they're pretty unified behind Barack or behind uh, Joe Biden because Donald Trump has really given them no uh, real window to to be supportive of his candidacy. And so uh, there'll be some pushback. I mean, but if you were a betting man and you had to go one way or another in the Biden campaign, uh, further left to embrace uh, uh, more the Black Lives Matter agenda, which includes defund the police, um, you're taking a risk. If you embrace the social justice aspects of that same movement, uh, but do it in a in a way that uh, preserves peace and 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 and, and order in society. Uh, you you you've sort of gone that way with Kamala Harris, and so she should fit the bill. Uh, they're going to have a reckoning within the Democratic Party. She's not progressive enough for much of the wing of the party that has a lot of energy. Uh, she's had a, a history that'll be uh, taken apart and put back together as a prosecutor, uh, but. Um, she stood that that challenge when she ran for president. A lot of that vetting got done. And so there probably won't be a lot of new news in that cycle. Now, in terms of how the news was broken here, the vice president tweeting this announcement earlier in the day, uh, we had learned that he had made his choice. We didn't know who the choice was, but that uh, the campaign was hoping to make the announcement on social media before it leaked out. Uh, they basically accomplished that, and it certainly speaks to the power of these platforms, how important these platforms are at a time when so much of the campaigning will have to be done remotely. Um, the vice president, Vice President Biden, has taken on uh, big tech, as ha has President Trump, though though for different reasons. Um, this is a, a show where we cover technology. How do you imagine that Kamala Harris will weigh in on some of these issues facing big tech companies, specifically antitrust issues, free speech issues, and how companies like Facebook and Twitter moderate hate on their platforms, given how important these platforms are to, you know, uh, political advertising, driving people to the polls, and, you know, solidifying views, essentially. I think the announcement today, exactly how you described it, is a is a homage to the social media movement that uh, you don't break news anymore by uh, doing a press release in traditional media. You don't break news anymore by going on the evening news uh, or on 60 Minutes even. Uh, you break news by going on a social media platform that you can drive eyeballs to and, and collect those eyeballs as part of a future campaign of outreach. Uh, the Biden campaign knows they are uh, uh, behind when it comes to the amount of throw weight they have within the social media world compared to what Donald Trump has built. And so part of this is a educated effort to try and build a bigger base within the social media platforms uh, that they put this out on today. So, so that, is, that is one aspect of the political piece of the technology side. There is no question going to be a very difficult reckoning uh, if uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris wind up in the White House in January uh, with the media technology firms uh, in America uh, for precisely the reasons you mentioned. Uh, integrity of news uh, is going to be a big debate on Capitol Hill, whether this administration or the next one likes it. Uh, and, and, and those issues are going to be reconciled in legislation. There will be uh, lots of bills passed, uh, and the question is, is that those bills going to come from a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House or a mix, and, and are they going to wind up on the desk of President Joe Biden or Donald Trump? Uh, the two of them do have a difference of opinion when it comes to many of these media platforms and social media uh, specifically, and so we'll see how uh, uh, they fare. I would say uh, if you compare uh, just the rhetoric of uh, Donald Trump and sort of his anti-media 
uh, fake news rhetoric to Biden, who I think goes out of his way to try and bolster the credentials of the media, both traditional and social, um, uh, at least there's an opening there to work with. But there's no question that the emerging right. issues of this decade are going to be uh, tech. And what these platforms don't have going for them is that they're facing fire from both sides of the aisle, though, um, as you mentioned, uh, for, for, for different reasons. Uh, Rick Davis, our Bloomberg contributing editor, former campaign manager for uh, Senator John McCain. Rick, thank you so much for joining us to weigh in. We're going to be talking about this more throughout the hour. Uh, former Vice President Joe Biden picking Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate. Coming up, we're going to dig into Facebook, removing, speaking of Facebook, 22 million pieces of hate speech from its platform just in the second quarter, exponentially more than it did last year. We'll have that and more coming up. Also, we are standing by for a news briefing by President Trump at the White House. We will take you there live when it happens. This is Bloomberg. Facebook has removed 22 and a half million pieces of hate speech for violating the company's policies. That is more than double the number taken down in the first three months of the year and up from just two and a half million posts two years ago. To discuss, we're joined by Bloomberg Tech, Sarah Fryer. And one of the interesting takeaways here, Sarah, is that Facebook is saying that technology and artificial intelligence is doing uh, vastly more of the identifying of these hateful posts than it has in the past. Talk to us about simply the size and scope of the numbers that Facebook gave us today? Well, it's way up from, from prior years, many multiples of what it was when Facebook started reporting this. And the reason, like you mentioned, it's not because there is more hate speech on the Internet. It's that Facebook is getting more aggressive at using its algorithmic detection. And part of that's because they have to. They had to send home a lot of their regular content moderators due to COVID. And a lot of the things that they try to moderate through Facebook, a lot of the user reports cannot be done from home. So hate speech is one of the things that's very tricky to train a machine learning algorithm to identify because there's so much that is, that is dependent on the context, dependent on the language. Um, but Facebook says that they're getting better at it, at least in English and some other languages now. And that's why you're seeing such a jump in the numbers. All right. Uh, Bloomberg, Sarah Fryer, thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, going to be a critical how Facebook handles this, especially leading into the election. Now, two and a half months away, of course, the big news this hour, uh, Vice President Joe Biden picking Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate. More on that coming up. This is Bloomberg. Joe Biden selecting Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate. This will be uh, surely a historic election. She is the first black and Asian American woman on a major party ticket. And of course, they are now running this campaign in the middle of a pandemic. Global cases of the coronavirus now topping 20 million. A recovery for the travel industry in that case it seems quite uncertain. Earlier, we spoke with the CEO of Booking Holdings, who says he doesn't expect travel demand to return until a vaccine scene is available. He spoke earlier on Bloomberg Television. Certainly people are seeing things better than the lows in April and March. It was horrible. Then the things that you were just saying, certainly things have improved a bit. That being said, you're right. Until we get a vaccine or some sort of effective treatment, travel is going to have some issues. And look, it's great that things are better than they were. But we are all still far away. And you just heard those occupancy numbers. And let's face it, a half-filled hotel is not profitable. So what we really need is that uh, sense of safety. People want to feel that it's OK to travel. And the thing that's going to help us get there is a vaccine. And hopefully we'll see something in the not-so-distant future. Is the worst behind you, do you think, Glenn? I, where do we go from here? Is it better <clears throat> or is it kind of plateauing now. I'm, I'm curious as to the kind of trajectory you think we're on. 
Well, I think a lot of people have been talking about the recent flare-ups in different parts of the world, places that have been fairly good, but now all of a sudden there are coming out with more infections that are causing lockdowns. You look in Australia and Melbourne, you, know, you look at some of the issues that have happened in Hong Kong. You know, there are parts of the world where things were great or very good, and now they're not so good. Even in Europe, as you're well familiar with, you're seeing a bunch of flare-ups here and there. So I think we're going to be on a bit of a roller coaster for quite a while until we get that vaccine. In my point, it doesn't really matter. We need that vaccine or some sort of effective treatment because when you read these things, it's terrible news items when people are still getting ill. Unfortunately, some people not making it through their illnesses. It scares people and people want to feel safe. You're going to go on a holiday. Yeah. You don't want to be nervous. So, Glenn, I mean, all of that leads to, you know, cash burn, et cetera. Uh, you didn't have to raise any cash so far. Your cash position is better than some of your peers. Uh, you are cutting some of the workforce. And I'm wondering how many levers left do you have to sort of make it through until there is a vaccine? Well, I think uh, we actually did raise over $4 billion. So uh, we felt pretty good about that $4 billion raise. But, you know, we are feeling comfortable in terms of where our balance sheet looks like. And we have, we've been very clear to the street. We have no problem getting through this uh, crisis. That being said, what will the other side of the, of the hill look like? What's going to change in terms of the industry? And you were mentioning about business travel, and business travel does provide a lot of revenue to some of the big chains, and certainly the front of the airplane is where those people are paying those big fares, helping those airlines. And what's going to happen? Are people going to be going on as many business trips as they did in the past? From our point of view, though, we're much more leisure oriented. So there's a little bit of a silver lining for us because when there's a lack of demand, well, those people on the supply side, they need, they are more interested in working with a distributor like us to help fill that uh, empty seat on a plane or an empty room in a hotel. That's unfortunately a little helpful to us and you don't want it that way, but that's what's gonna happen. Glenn Fogel there, the CEO of Booking Holdings. Again, the big news this hour, former Vice President Joe Biden picking Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate. She is the first black and Asian American woman to be on a major party ticket. She has won statewide elections in California three times, of course, cut her chops as a prosecutor, has been to, in a sense, already vetted by the American public, having run for president, though she did drop out of the race fairly early. It is, uh, in some sense, a surprise, uh, given how uh, she and Biden interacted in some of the earlier debates, but a big decision and largely now seen as sort of a safer decision for, for Vice President Joe Biden here. He, he announced the news on Twitter, and we're now hearing that he plans to, uh, and she plans to deliver a speech tomorrow in Delaware. Um, more on that uh, later in the show. We're also standing by for a news briefing by President Trump. We will take you live to the White House when that happens. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Former Vice President Joe Biden picking officially Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate for the 2020 presidential election. The first black and Asian American woman on a major party ticket. Joining us now to discuss, we've got Joel Rubin, Democratic strategist and former deputy assistant secretary for legislative affairs at the State Department. He is also the president of the Washington Strategy Group. Joel, so good to have you with us. First of all, what is your reaction to this? What does this signal to the ticket? Well, it's great to be with you, Emily. And this signals that Joe Biden is, is all in, that he is bringing on board a, a strong progressive African African American woman who uh, is a powerful senator with national chops, and he's going to take the fight to Donald Trump. So it, at its core, he's found a partner who is going to stand with him as a, a combined ticket of the face of America, and it stands in stark contrast to, to Donald Trump and Mike Pence. And uh, it's going to be a very aggressive uh, team heading down the home stretch here into November. Now. 
Obviously, Joel, there's been so much speculation leading up to this announcement. And, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we were hearing that perhaps um, Joe Biden wouldn't be able to get over some of the issues that uh, he had on early in the campaign with Kamala Harris, who, you know, really it took him to the mat in, in terms of his record on busing. Um, there was some back and forth. After that, what do you make of the fact that he was able to get over that in terms of making this pick? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a great question. I don't think he was ever the person who had to get over it. I think it was many of the people who who uh, were were advising him potentially that that had to, to deal with it. But he seemed to be the kind of person, and he is the kind of person that can look past debates and and political clashes because he understands politics. And I think that's that's a really strong quality in a leader is that he can work with and engage diversity and diversity of opinion. And that's what we need right now. And what, what Joe Biden is bringing to the table is leadership, uh, a, a quality of healing, of engaging people, of being able to respect difference. And that's such a different tone from what we have in the White House right now. And so it's a, sh uh, it's a, a show of strength, a sign that he is, is the kind of person who has enough self-confidence to be able to deal with those who may not, dis may not agree with him on everything and bring them on board. That's a very good sign for him. Uh, we're hearing that Senator Harris is scheduled to speak in Delaware tomorrow. Uh, Vice President Biden made the announcement on Twitter, which speaks to the power that these platforms will have, especially in a remote campaign. They've now got some hard work cut out for them. I know that um, Biden is ahead in the polls, but talk to us about what they need to accomplish here. Number one, getting more people to vote. Right. With three months to go, th this really is. And, and the convention will be next week. And then after that, it's the final sprint. It's the, the, the get out the vote moment where uh, uh, Vice President Biden and Kamala Harris are going to be leading the charge. And it's really about many of the swing states, in particular uh, in, in the Midwest, in Michigan, in Minnesota. It's about states like Arizona that are on the fence and that could potentially flip and states like Florida as well where it's critical to get voters mobilized and out. Uh, if Democrats, if we get our voters out, we will win this election uh, because the polls show us that, that that is the case. But getting people out is always the hardest test, and it's one that no one can take for granted. So I think we're going to see the campaign emphasize as much as possible voter contact through the Zoom and through the COVID uh, pandemic. It's, it's harder, but there will be a significant amount invested in technology, uh, in texting and emailing and engagement online through digital to get people to come out and vote, uh, but more importantly as well, to uh, ensure that they do their mail-in balloting that uh, the President Trump is so afraid of. Biden's ability to connect remotely and connect on social media has been questioned, especially since uh, President Trump has so expertly used social media to his advantage. You know, obviously, uh, Senator Harris is a much uh, younger uh, candidate. Do you think that her bringing her on to the ticket will improve the way that the campaign uses and connects on some of these digital channels? Well, Kamala Harris ran for president already. She has built up her own independent infrastructure, and we're going to see that merge with Joe Biden's infrastructure and, of course, the, D the Democratic National Committee, the DNC's infrastructure, and, and others who have endorsed him. And it's really important to uh, ensure that their infrastructure, their list, their engagement does reach everyone. So uh, it's going to require a lot of creative messaging. It's, it's a complicated environment when one doesn't have the door-to-door -door canvassing operation that is typical for a campaign uh, of this uh, of this nature in particular. Uh, so we're going to have to see a lot of creative ads, a lot of direct messaging, a lot of online uh, fora that do highlight the candidates. But I think the one benefit that, that we have here now with, with Sarah Harris is she is a national figure in and of herself. She has stature. Combining that with Joe Biden, who has, has nearly five decades of national presence, uh, is is a is a, a ticket that is already well known. So it's less about name identification and more about just ensuring that there's voter mobilization amongst the base, and that's where the the, the campaign is going to really focus its efforts.
let's talk about this from a policy perspective. Obviously, uh, Biden has recently unveiled his economic plan. We know that uh, Senator Harris um, has taken on health care as one of her issues. We're very concerned with the antitrust issues facing big tech. What kind of influence do you mm -hmm. think that she will have on his campaign and his policy proposals now that she is officially um, part of the ticket? Well, she's she's a heavyweight on on issues of of law and order, national security, and, and intelligence in the Senate, and she uh, made a name for herself early on as a, a very powerful questioner of uh, Bill Barr, of Brett Kavanaugh, and uh, of other uh, uh, judicial officials in, in in the Trump administration. So uh, you can bet that she's going to have a, a significant say over the questions of of how the Justice Department works, uh, of how. Commerce is being executed in this country. Uh, it really, a lot of the domestic issues that run through antitrust are going to be issues that certainly she's going to have a hand in, uh, and and uh, she she's not going to be she's not a uh, a vice president vice presidential pick to sit on the sidelines. That's for sure, and I think that's to Joe Biden's credit. In many ways, he's taking a playbook out of what Barack Obama did in 2008 when Barack Obama picked a seasoned, strong senator named Joe Biden, who is a real, really a partner. We've seen that before with Democratic tickets, where we have a strong number two who comes in with a portfolio they can execute. And, and uh, okay. I'll just mention, you know, Kamala Joel. Harris, she was uh, the DA in California, and that's a major portfolio. She has a lot of debt on the Absolutely. All right, Joel Rubin, thank you so much. We're going to listen in to President Trump, who's just taken the podium. New York, Portland, Chicago, and Seattle. The mayors and governors of these States and cities have an absolute duty to use all resources necessary to end the violence and all of the injury and death. New York City has an army of great police. I know them very well. And uh, the law enforcement and the New York's finest are as good as it gets, and they should be allowed to do their job. If they do their job, if they're allowed to do their job, the New York city problem will be solved and be solved quickly. They do it well. The mayor, Bill de Blasio, should immediately hire back all of the police who were fired. Without justification, they were fired. I guess that's part of defund the police by the Democrats. They should hire New York City's finest back. You have some incredible policemen doing specific jobs that nobody else can do, actually when it comes to terrorism and other things. Together, the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois have 25,000 police officers, sheriffs, and guardsmen available to quell any violence. They can do it very quickly, very easily, if allowed to do their jobs. Again, if allowed to do their jobs. Our police, our law enforcement is incredible, but they have to be allowed to do their jobs, the Democrats or the radical left Democrats or both, because they're becoming one and the same. If you look at election results, the Democrats are being taken over by the radical left. The city of Portland and the state of Oregon have 10,000 fine officers and guardsmen available. Seattle, Washington, and Washington State have 10,000 available. So Seattle, city of Seattle, and Washington State itself, they have great people. They have to be allowed to do their job. I'm urging them to deploy these resources to protect their citizens and to stop the violence and all of the things that we watch on television going on, although a lot of the, unfortunately, fake news don't like to put it on because it shows that the Democrats are doing a very bad job of law enforcement. They have to put it on. They have to be honest with the people of this country. But I'm offering all available federal support requested to stop the violence and arrest the criminals. We have to be asked by the governors or the mayors, and we'll be there very rapidly. It's ready, willing, and able. We're all ready, willing, and able to go to these jurisdictions and take care of them. We'll do them very quickly. You saw what happened in Minneapolis. They ripped the city apart when the National Guard went in. It ended. Immediately. It was immediate and lasted. These acts of destruction are not isolated incidents, but demonstrate the pattern of violent left-wing extremism that you get to see if you're watching the right news program. 
under any rational definition, the arson attack on the police precinct in Portland would be considered an act of left-wing domestic terrorism. They really are anarchists. These are left-wing anarchists. They are anarchists. And I'm directing the Department of Justice to stop these anarchists, immediately to stop them, and to work with the city and the state to get the job done. Local authorities have to investigate and prosecute all of these crimes. Immediately, we'll work with you. And the local authorities know who they are. They know where they come from. They know a lot about them. They ought to get their act together and get it done, and we're ready to help. If you need that help, you shouldn't need that help, actually. You should be able to do it yourselves and get it done very well. Again, you have excellent police and law enforcement, but you have to let them do their job. What you're seeing in Portland, in Seattle, New York, Chicago is really the Democrat roadmap for America. They want every city in America to resemble Portland in a form. They want to pass federal legislation gutting and hamstringing every police department in America. They want to get rid of your Second Amendment. They want to end cash bail, close prisons, defund police departments, or at least largely defund. You see that with New York, a billion dollars they took out of their police department, and crime has gone through the roof and appoint far-left prosecutors who side with the criminals and target law-abiding citizens. If the left gains power, no city, town, or suburb in our country will be safe. On the vaccine front, some very good news. Today, I met with the leaders of Operation Warp Speed, our historic undertaking to produce a safe and effective vaccine in record time. We heard an update from the top scientists in the government and the leaders of pharmaceutical companies, which right now aren't uh, too thrilled with me. They're taking millions of dollars' worth of ads because I've created a favored nation status for drugs, which is going to reduce drug prices by 40, 50, 60, and maybe even 70 percent in some cases, numbers that have never been heard of or thought of. So when you see those ads, remember, that means you're drug prices are coming down. When you see ads attacking your president, it's very simple. That means drug prices are going to be falling very soon. This evening, I'm pleased to announce that we have reached an agreement with Moderna to manufacture and deliver 100 million doses of their coronavirus vaccine candidate. The federal government will own these vaccine doses. We're buying them. Recently, we also secured partnerships with Johnson & Johnson as well as Sanofi and GSX to support the large-scale manufacturing of their vaccines, doing very well in those vaccines. Tremendous promise in every single one of them, and we have many of them. And they're years ahead of schedule. This would have been if it were in the previous administration or any of the previous administrations. Where we are now would have taken years. Three vaccine candidates are now in phase three trials already the final stage of clinical trials. This is the final stage. We are investing in the development and manufacture of the top six vaccine candidates to ensure rapid delivery. The military is ready to go. They're ready to deliver a vaccine to Americans as soon as one is fully approved by the FDA, and we're moving very close to that approval. We're on track to rapidly produce 100 million doses as soon as the vaccine is approved, and up to 500 million shortly thereafter. So we'll have 600 million doses. Operation Warp Speed is the largest and most advanced operation of its kind anywhere in the world and anywhere in history. We've treated more than 86,000 Americans with convalescent plasma. A recent Mayo Clinic study found that this treatment may produce results which are incredible. We look to a reduction and reduced mortality rate by 50 percent and possibly even more than 50 percent. I urge Americans who have recovered from the virus to go to coronavirus.gov and sign up and donate. We would really appreciate that because 
It's been very successful, unbelievably successful. And we would love you to go and donate. As we continue to confront the global pandemic, the United States economy is rebounding with strength like nobody thought possible. You've seen the numbers. You see what's going on yesterday, today, and tomorrow, in my opinion. We're very poised for a great third quarter and very poised for some great stock market numbers and 401k numbers and everything else. Today, the Dow Jones passed 28,000 points for the first time, more than a 50 percent surge since just March. So we've increased by 50 percent more than since just March. It has gained approximately 9,500 points that same period, March and has recovered nearly all of its value since the virus struck our nation. Think of that. America's economy is incredible, and its economic recovery is outpacing our peer nations. Last quarter, the European Union's GDP decline was nearly 40 percent worse than the United States. So it's 40 percent worse than the United States. We've built such a strong base that we're able to do things. and sustained better than anybody in the world by far. France's GDP decline was nearly 80 percent worse than ours, and Spain experienced an economic contraction twice as severe as the United States. Nationwide, we continue to see improvements in our fight against the pandemic, very substantial improvements. Since last week, 87 percent of the counties in the United States report declining cases. Think of that. 87 percent of the counties in the United States, they reported declining cases. Mortality has declined by 7 percent, and hospitalizations are declining rapidly. States that were primary hotspots, such as Florida, Texas, and Arizona, have reduced cases by nearly 25 percent. But all Americans must remain vigilant, practice good hygiene, socially distance, wear a mask. Whenever possible, whenever you are getting too close to people, wear a mask and protect the elderly. Always protect the elderly. Since the end of July, the seven-day average for cases in the United States has fallen by nearly 20 percent. But the virus continues to increase in nations across the globe. Last week, France and Germany both recorded their highest daily number of new cases in three months. Not that I want to bring that up, but might as well explain it to the media. The seven-day case average for Germany has increased by 62 percent since last week, unfortunately. And that is truly unfortunate. It's increased 82 percent in France, 113 percent in Spain, and 30 percent in the United Kingdom. Those are big uh, increases. Cases are also rapidly increasing in the Netherlands, Sweden, Belgium, F Switzerland, Slovakia, Estonia, and other European countries. And in our country, they're going down. We will be seeing that even more rapidly as time goes by, short time. Even though America has the largest at-risk population, including 1.5 million residents of nursing homes, about five times that of other European countries, Europe has experienced a nearly 40 percent higher excess mortality rate than the United States. We also have fewer deaths per capita, excluding the disastrous deaths from the New York tri-state area, which had a very, very hard time, and did better than our peer nations of Western Europe, thanks to our excellent and highly advanced medical care and skill something that the news doesn't tell you. They don't tell you that. They don't like to tell you that. The United States has now conducted more than 66 million tests, far more than any other nation in the world. India, which has a population of 1.5 billion people, has done 24 million. So we're at 66 million. And think of it, India is at 24 million, and India is second. The entire region of Latin America, comprising 33 countries, has conducted 25 million tests, yet Latin America has more confirmed cases by far than the United States. As we safely restore our great economy and reopen our schools and hopefully 
We can watch colleges play football. We want to get football in colleges. These are young, strong people. They won't have a big problem with the China virus. So we want to see college football start. And uh, hopefully, a lot of great people uh, are going to be out there. They're going to be out there playing football, and they'll be able to fight it off. And hopefully, it won't bother them one bit. Most of them will never get it, statistically. But we know we'll see more cases at some point, and uh, we will eventually develop sufficient immunity in addition to everything else that we're doing. So college football, get out there and play football. People want to see it. And stand for your American flag. Stand for your national anthem, because people are not happy when that doesn't happen. You look at the NBA and what's happening with the NBA and their poor ratings. I don't know. Can't imagine why. But they didn't stand. They didn't show respect to our flag. They didn't show respect to our, an our, our national anthem. And uh, maybe that's having an impact. but. Just uh, not good. The NFL had its problems two years ago when that happened. They went way down in their ratings and their fans. And they struggled back. And now, all of a sudden, they're putting themselves in the same position. So stand for your flag and stand for the national anthem. And I think you're going to do fantastically well. Because a lot of people aren't going to watch if you don't. I'm one of them. That's why our strategy and attention are focused on preventing the cases that are most likely to require discussing the opening of schools, hospitalization, or produce any death. We have to maintain vigilance over our elderly population. We've learned that, I think, more than any single event, Scott. We have to be very vigilant all over, but we have to really protect our elderly population, and especially our elderly population that has problems with heart, lung, uh, any form of, of sickness, uh, diabetes in particular. And we uh, are, at the same time, in very good shape with respect to hospital uh, room and hospital overcrowding. We're in great shape. On the nursing home front, protecting our nursing home residents is a critical focus of our strategy. HHS recently announced that they will use the Provider Relief Fund to deliver an additional $5 billion to further protect nursing homes and long-term care facilities as they continue to combat the China virus. We have delivered over 1,800 rapid point-of-care testing devices to nursing homes. And we are in the process of delivering these devices to all 15,000 Medicare and Medicaid-certified nursing homes by the end of September. So they're going to have very, very rapid tests. They won't have to wait around two or three days or four days. And that number has come down very substantially compared to what it was when you send it to the labs. You get very accurate tests, but it takes a period of time to send it, to check it, and then to send it back. But we are now at a position where we're sending very, very rapid tests, five minutes to 15 minutes. We will care for America's seniors as we develop the vaccine and therapeutics. And therapeutics are coming along very, very well. We think we have some great answers on therapeutics, and you'll be hearing that about them in the very near future. I'm very much into the world of therapeutics, where you go into the hospital and you give a shot or you do what you have to do with it, perhaps transfusion, it's combinations of what you can do, and people get better. I like that very much. I like that uh, very, very much. And that could even proceed uh, in a successful uh, uh, in getting it. Uh, that will, I think, probably even proceed vaccines. But therapeutically, we're doing very, very well. A lot of people are going to be very happy when they see some of the numbers that were that I'm seeing and some of the results. So tremendous things are happening on the vaccine front and the therapeutic front. And uh, our country should be very proud of itself. We're going to get it delivered very rapidly as soon as it comes out. Okay, uh, questions, please. please Thank you, ahead. Mr. President. 20 million people are due to be evicted from their homes next month. And 
are you do you fear that this could be your Herbert Hoover move moment if you do not be, reach a deal with Congress to set up a new CARES Act? We, we are not allowing that to happen. We're stopping evictions. We are stopping evictions. We're not going to let that happen. And also, we're not going to evict people. We're not going to let people. The Democrats, maybe they don't care, but I care. And we signed an executive offer, you know, uh, executive order. You know that, right? And uh, we are not letting people be evicted. With a suggestion. Uh, thank you. Thank you, President Trump. Uh, if I could have two questions, I'd, I'd like to ask you one about Senator Harris's record and then a different one about FISA abuse. Sure. Um, so regarding uh, Senator Harris's record, you had a, a pretty uh, quick response to that. You had an ad out that said that she was a phony. And I wanted to drill down. That she was a what? A phony. Phony. Oh. And I wanted to ask about a specific example that a lot of people thought was a phony moment. Um, as San Francisco DA, she oversaw, according to the Mercury News, 1,900 marijuana convictions. But she was asked in an interview last year if she had smoked marijuana, and she appeared to joke and, according to some people, lie and say that she was listening to Snoop Dogg and Tupac while their music hadn't come out at the time, while she said she was smoking pot listening to it. Um, why, why would she lie about that? Do you see that as more evidence that is surpassed on marijuana a liability? Well, she lied. I mean, she said things that were untrue. Uh, she is uh, a person that's told many, many stories that weren't true. She's very big into raising taxes. She wants to slash funds for our military at a level that nobody can even believe. She uh, is against fracking. Fracking is — she's against petroleum products. I mean, how do you do that and go into Pennsylvania or Ohio or Oklahoma or the great state of Texas. She's against uh, fracking. Fracking's a big deal. Uh, she's in favor of socialized medicine, where you're going to lose your doctors, you're going to lose your plan. She wants to take uh, your health care plans away from 180 million Americans. 180 million Americans that are very happy with their health insurance, and she wants to take that away. So she was my number one pick. I mean, she was, I, as they would say, because hopefully you'll start college football, she was my number one draft pick. And we'll see how she works out. She did very, very poorly in the uh, primaries, as you know. She was expected to do well. And she was — she ended up at right around 2 percent and spent a lot of money. She had a lot of things happening. And so I was a little surprised that he picked her. I've been watching her for a long time, and I was a little surprised. She was extraordinarily nasty to uh, Kavanaugh, Ju Judge Kavanaugh then, now Justice mm -hmm. Kavanaugh. She was nasty to a level that was just uh, a horrible thing, the way she was, the way she treated now Justice Kavanaugh. And I won't forget that soon. So she did very poorly in the primaries, and now she's chosen. So let's see how that all works well, out. Does the marijuana legalization vote for you rather than her because she convicted so many people in the past? Uh, I can't tell you what she's voting for. I don't think she knows what. I think Joe knows even less than she does. But I was a little surprised at the pick. A lot of people were saying that might be the pick. I was more surprised than anything else because she did so poorly. Many people did much better than her in the primaries. She did very poorly in the primaries. And that's like a poll. You know, that's like a poll. Can I also ask you about FISA abuse, uh, President Trump? Um, yes, about FISA abuse. Um, so now it's widely accepted among Republicans that there was FISA abuse. Tremendous uh, the, FISA abuse, yes. Uh, the Justice Department IG has found that with the Carter Page Warren application. But uh, we were actually warned in 2013 that the surveillance court was allegedly a rubber stamp, it was approving surveillance. And I was wondering, uh, I don't think, as President, you commented on Edward Snowden, but do you think he should be allowed to return without going to prison? So as far as Pfizer abuse is concerned, there was tremendous Pfizer abuse. It's amazing that it's taken this long, and everyone knows that it's been uh, proven very substantially, not only Pfizer abuse, uh, changing documents and putting documents in front of the FISA court and courts that are um, disgraceful that they could have done it. And the fact is, we caught Joe Biden, President Obama, the whole group. You can look at Brennan and Comey and Clapper, the whole group. We caught them spying on our campaign. This was an illegal act.